thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you, uh, Christina, for this clear and colorful colloquium talk. Um, I'm going to discuss um, plateau problems, so a volume minimization problem that happens in an infinite dimensional manifold and some of its applications. So here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to first introduce this so-called spherical plateau problem, motivate it, give you some examples, and uh, mention some typical questions that you can ask about this problem. In the second part, I'm going to start talking about classifications uh, for uh, spherical plateau solutions in certain specific cases and uh, uh, ask some questions. Uh, in the third part, I'm going to apply that to certain stability problems. And finally, I'm going to talk about structure results, or at least the partial results that um, we can get right now. And I'm going to mention some uh, conjectures. So that's the outline. Uh, a caveat here is that there's, it's mostly partial results uh, and speculations. It's going to be um, markedly more questions than answers. Um, and if you have any comments or feedbacks, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from you. Okay. So let's start. First, what do I mean by plateau problem? I just mean the following setup. Usually you uh, take a, say, compact Riemannian manifold, you fix a topological class, say, an integer homology class, and you look at the following invariant for this homology class, which is the infimum of the mass of C, where C is an integral current with compact support representing H. So here, M of C is again the mass or the volume of the cycle C that was defined in the colloquium talk. And uh, you're interested in trying to achieve that infimum. So you consider a minimizing sequence of cycles CI that represents that uh, homology class. So minimizing means that the limit of the masses is equal to the infimum of the possible masses. And the so-called plateau problem, generalized plateau problem consists of trying to construct limits of such minimizing sequences and studying their structure, their partial regularity. Uh, this problem is at least in principle interesting because we're trying to find um, kind of canonical geometric representative for this topological class. So you try to optimize the shape considering certain topological constraints. So this is the usual plateau problem. I'm going to today to uh, focus on a very specific plateau problem that happens not in a Riemannian manifold, but in a Hilbert manifold. And uh, the ambient space is going to be a space of the following kind is going to be a quotient of the Hilbert sphere. Uh, let's see. So you consider a countable group, gamma, and you consider the unique up to isometry, uh, separable infinite dimensional Hilbert sphere with its usual round metric. You can identify that sphere with the sphere in L2 of gamma. So L2 of gamma is the space of L2 functions on this discrete group, gamma. Gamma acts canonically on that sphere by isometries and properly uh, using the usual regular representation. So I remind you that the regular representation is defined as follows for any element of the group gamma zero. Um, you take a function in L2 in the unit sphere, f. So gamma zero of f is going to be this new function defined using translation by uh, multiplication by uh, gamma zero minus one, okay? So uh, this gamma is going to act nicely on S infinity and you want to take the quotient. Um, I, my claim right now is that it's interesting to take the quotient. So if you think about that, given, um, given gamma, one of the nicest or most canonical space you can cook up using gamma is this quotient of the unit sphere. 
Uh, right, so this is our ambient space. Uh, you can think of it as a Hilbert manifold. It's not exactly going to be a Hilbert manifold in general when gamma has torsion. So when gamma has torsion, the action that I mentioned earlier by the regular representation is not free. And so the quotient is not quite a manifold, but uh, we're going to ignore that point. So if you want, just consider a case where gamma is torsion free, okay? Now you can fix a homology class as before of this space. Uh, in fact, it comes from a group homology class. And as before, you can define a volume for this homology class. I'm going to call that the spherical volume. The spherical volume of H is going to be the infimum of the mass of C, where C is an integral current with compact support in that space that represents the homology class H. And now integral currents is in the sense of Ambrosio and Kirchheim, of course. And by the way, so I'm going to use this theory of uh, metric currents by Ambrosio and Kirchheim, but really in a mild way, not in its full power, because I'm mostly considering just integral currents in Hilbert spaces or Hilbert manifolds. Right, so this- oh, but, but, uh, well, I ask you something, but even if the group is aman amenable, even without torsion, you have, may have some problems, no? No, about because- the bad points there. Yeah, so um, being amenable- Probably your group is not amenable, not, never amenable. Yeah, yeah, so, so you, you can have a group that's amenable or not, but if you're torsion free, then the action itself is going to be free. So the quotient is going to be nice. Yeah, it's free, but it had almost fixed point, yeah. It has almost fixed point, but uh, it's proper. So you can check that the action is proper, even though you have almost fixed point. So of course, if you allow the base point to vary in the sphere, then the injectivity radius is going to zero. That's fine, that, that's true. But for a given point, the injectivity radius is going to be strictly yes, positive. For a given point, of course, it's, it's okay, yeah. Yeah. So just locally, you, you just see a Hilbert manifold if you're torsion free. I'm going to come back to um, amenable versus non-amenable. But um, let me continue and, and say that this invariant is really due to Besson, Courtois, and Gallo. Uh, they introduced that um, in their work on the so-called entropy inequality. So they have a version of that um, invariant that they call the spherical volume. And this spherical volume itself is somehow inspired by a more topological version of that invariant that is due to uh, Misha Gromov, which is called the simplicial volume. We can think of the simplicial volume as basically a topological and stable version of the spherical volume. Right, so since we're considering this plateau problem, we, you, you want to take a minimizing sequence of cycles, CI, uh, meaning that the limit of the mass is converging. Uh, it, it, the limit is the spherical volume of the homology class. And now in order to extract a geometric limit, we really need Wenger's compactness theorem. That's essential. This compactness theorem, I remind you, is as, as mentioned before, is expressed using the uh, intrinsic flat topology of Christina Swamrani and Stefan Wenger. And just to remind you the statement, so here for a sequence of boundaryless integral current CI with uniform bounded mass and uniformly bounded diameters, you can find a subsequence converging in the intrinsic flat topology. In our case, the bound, uniform bound on the mass is automatic because you're trying to look at the minimizing sequence. And the uniform bound on the diameter is also automatic because everything lives in that quotient of the unit sphere, okay? So you can apply that uh, compactness theorem. What it means concretely is that there are a sequence, there is a sequence of isometric embeddings of those currents that I'm calling Ji inside a Banach space B, mm. such that the push forward currents converge in the uh, usual flat topology in that Banner space to some limits infinity. And um, let's see. So 
the key point here is that Cinfinity, uh, I didn't mention it on the slide, but Cinfinity is itself an integral card. So that's the key point, right? You, you have compactness to something that is still pretty regular. Um, another remark is here, I use Banner space in the definition. You, 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 you write it using a general metric space, but uh, you can embed everything in a Banner space. Right, so you're interested in those kind of abstract minimizers of the volume, C infinity, and you can view them intrinsically. It's better to view them intrinsically instead of depending on the ambient Banner space that you just used to cook up this limit. So you consider it as an integral current space as defined by uh, Christina in her uh, colloquium talk. So the definition here is that you call any such infinity that you can, can obtain using that compactness theorem a spherical plateau solution for the homology class H. And to put it simply, our main goal is just to understand the relationship between this pair, group, and homology class. And on the other hand, all the spherical plateau solutions, which are geometric objects. And here are some of the difficulties when you try to study that relationship. The first difficulty is that this Hubert manifold, say gamma is torsion free, this Hubert manifold does not contain any closed minimal immersion of finite dimension. So in fact, minimizing sequences CI never converge to a limit that's embedded inside S infinity over gamma. This S infinity should be uh, the same. Right? And so that's why we need this intrinsic flat topology, because if you just use the flat topology, even though everything is contained in one given ambient space, this S infinity over gamma, the sequence is never going to converge in something inside this S infinity over gamma. It's going to get somewhere else. And that's very in contrast to the uh, finite dimensional case. A second and related problem is that the injectivity radius of S infinity over gamma is never bounded away from zero. Your, your group can be torsion free, non amenable the injectivity radius is just not going to be bounded away from zero. And that causes problems when trying to study the um, general structure of limits, because the limits now are living in some potentially degenerate. Wait, wait, wait. If it's non-amenable, it's, it's is away from zero, or it's T property or something, then it will be away from zero. No, so here uh, you don't need T property because uh, non-amenable enough. Not non-amenable is bound to be from zero. It's a regular representation, so it's enough. It's enough to be non-amenable. Why you say it's never injectivity radius or such? No, so for I'm just saying that for any group, um, there is a function of uh, L to norm one such so that you translate this function by one well-chosen element that's non-trivial, you're going to end up um, very close. I see, I see, I see. Oh yeah, for individual element, of course, yeah, I agree. I agree. For individual elements, I, I'm sorry, of course. Altogether, yeah, it's bounded. I, I, I'm sorry, yeah. Sure, yeah, sure, just sure. one element. One yeah, 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 element. yeah, I understood, yeah, I'm sorry. So anyway, so geometrically, I, we have no bounded geometry and uh, th this is, uh, kind of a very serious problem, in fact. Mm, so, yeah, those comments I wanted to make uh, about this uh, Hubert manifold. Let's continue. Uh, what is the motivation to study this uh, plateau problem? It's, it's not very clear at the beginning, but let me try to explain one of my early motivations. And it comes from a problem, a question by uh, Tom. And I think it was um, kind of asked independently by Hoff and Yao. So Tom asked the following question. So if you're given a closed manifold M, is there a best metric on M? What I like about this question is that it's very open-ended. You need to define what you mean by uh, best metric. But 
if you think a little bit about that, you realize that the uh, possible answers are not satisfying if you insist on having a Riemannian metric on M itself. And you have many hints at the fact that it's not a good question as such. For example, you can look at the work of Nabutovsky and find Berger. So again, this question is interesting, but uh, as such, it does not have an interesting answer, in fact. So to make it more interesting, let's be a little bit open-minded and let's reinterpret this question as asking for just a special metric space that you associate to M. So you're, you're, you're willing to sacrifice a lot of topology. Let, let's just try to construct in a meaningful way, a metric space coming from M. So the strategy here, instead of trying to, you know, work on M itself and try to modify the shape of M, you just embed M inside that spherical quotient and you try to minimize the volume in its say homotopy class. Then you get the limit and this limit should be in principle an answer to that question, hopefully. Uh, the hope is that you get something um, interesting. So that's the motivation. And um, let me be a little bit more precise about what I mean by embedding M inside this uh, spherical quotient. Consider a closed oriented manifold with fundamental group gamma. Um, you can look at the fundamental class of M, it's a homology class in M, but it naturally determines a homology class in this quotient uh, S infinity over gamma. There's a natural way to do that in topology. And in particular, so to M, now you have identified a corresponding homology class in this spherical quotient. So you can run the spherical plateau problem and get the corresponding spherical plateau solution. And we will see that in some cases, some very special cases, first, the spherical volume can be computed. And that is mostly due to Besson, Courtois, and Gallo. And secondly, the spaces that you get, the spherical plateau solutions can be almost classified. So that's really nice. But for now, let us mention that if the group is small, so if, if gamma is small, the fundamental group of M uh, is small in the sense that it's amenable, for example, finite or billion, et cetera, then we always have that the spherical volume is zero and the spherical plateau solutions are always trivial. So um, the spherical plateau problem is not going to be so interesting if you look at small uh, fundamental groups, small groups. Mm. I'm not going to, it's not, not too hard to prove, but let's just look at the case of uh, the circle. So if M is the closed circle, then gamma is Z. And you can show that the spherical volume of um, the corresponding homology class is zero by observing the following thing. So for any epsilon, there is a function uh, of unique norm. So in S infinity, such that if you translate it by one and then you take the difference, you take the L2 norm of that, it's smaller than epsilon. In other words, the injectivity radius of, of the spherical quotient is uh, not bounded away from zero. And that's enough to show that the spherical volume or the circle is zero. And that generalizes to uh, amenable groups. Any questions? Good. Um, right, so roughly speaking, there are at least two kinds of questions you are interested in when you, you look at this spherical plateau problem. The first is the kind of obvious one, which is given some special, very special pairs of group and homology class, is it possible to classify the spherical plateau solutions of, uh, of this class? And the second question is the following. So what is the structure of Synfinity in general? So now you're not making some extra assumption on gamma and H. What is the structure of Synfinity? For example, when is it non-empty? We just saw that when gamma is amenable, 
C infinity is always empty, but it's not clear that the converse is true. And does it embed nicely in an ambient space? Because right now, so far, C infinity is just an abstract integral current space that does not embed nicely in some um, ambient space. Hopefully you can, you would like to answer those questions. What I'm going to do next is to give you some results on the first question mostly, and give you some applications of uh, answers to the first question. Those applications have to do with stability problems. And, but in the future, I think the second question is uh, maybe more important. Uh, I will only, barely touch upon the second question towards the end. All right, so um, classification results. If you take M to be a hyperbolic manifold, then it, it is true that the spherical volume of M can be computed. So what I say spherical volume of M, it's the spherical volume of the homology class determined by M in that spherical quotient. And uh, the work of bessoncourt gallo directly implies the following, which is that the spherical volume of M is equal essentially to the hyperbolic volume of M up to a normalizing constant. And uh, in dimension two, the proof is pretty simple, but in dimension three and above, it's highly non-trivial and bessoncourt gallo use the so-called barycenter map or natural maps, uh, projection maps to show this theorem. So that's nice. The spherical volume can be computed in some very specific cases. Once you know the spherical volume, you can ask for uh, uniqueness of the spherical plateau solutions or kind of classifications. So what are all the possible synfinities that you can cook up using that homology class when you try to minimize the volume. And it's a fact that if, again, you start with a closed oriented hyperbolic manifold, in dimension three and above, spherical plateau solutions for M are all intrinsically isometric to the hyperbolic metric up to a constant. So here, the hyperbolic metric on M is unique up to isometries. And a uh, more recent result is that in dimension two, spherical plateau solutions for M are not unique, but they're intrinsically isometric to a rescaled hyperbolic surface, so sigma G, where sigma G can be any finite volume hyperbolic oriented surface with same Euler characteristic as sigma. So again, if you take any spherical plateau solutions, then viewed if you look at the intrinsic metric, you're going to have something that's intrinsically isometric to such a fine volume hyperbolic surface. And conversely, you take any finite volume hyperbolic oriented surface with same Euler characteristic as, as um, sorry, it should be M here. So same Euler characteristic uh, as M, that is intrinsically isometric to uh, a specific spherical plateau solution for M. Um, um, let, let me say one word about intrinsically isometric. So here, I do not know if the spherical, for example, in, in case one, I do not know if the spherical plateau solutions are in fact unique up to just usual isometries. I can only show that if you're allowing yourself to look at the intrinsic metric, then you see something that you recognize. It's the uh, hyperbolic metric. So here you start with this uh, topological manifold, you try to minimize the volume and you get a metric space, which gives you basically the hyperbolic metric. Mm. And on surfaces, you have many hyperbolic metrics. So that's why essentially you, you, you can have many uh, different plateau solutions. And um, so the proof of one is quote unquote, just combining the theory of metric currents with the projection map of BC of uh, Besson Courtois and Gallo. That's essentially it. That's essentially it. But the second point is more delicate. 
it also uses the work of Besson Quartier Gallo, but it's a different paper, and uh, it you need some kind of calibration to uh, um, show the classification. So these are some um, simple examples, special examples, where you can first compute the spherical volume and second, almost classify the spherical plateau solutions that you can get. Let's see other examples. In three, three dimension, you have geometrization. So it's a good place to, to try to test whether or not you can do something. And um, it happens that yes. So let's consider this time a closed oriented three manifold, not necessarily hyperbolic. You know by the geometrization theorem that there's a topological decomposition of M, which is canonical. And one part of this decomposition is the so-called hyperbolic part of M that I'm going to call M hype. And this M hype is a finite union of finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds. This M hype is uniquely determined by M as well as the metric, which is uh, uniquely determined by uh, M. And you can run the spherical plateau problem, meaning you embed that M in the spherical space form, and you try to minimize the volume, you get the limit. The claim is that this limit has to be intrinsically isometric to uh, the hyperbolic part of M up to a constant. I forgot to, to write up to a constant here. So that's nice because it gives you a very large collection of um, manifolds where the minimization problem gives you something non-trivial that you can really identify. Again, up to intrinsic isometries. And uh, so this hyperbolic part of M, which is uh, canonical, emerges naturally from this volume minimization problem, which is non-trivial because a priori, you start with just the quotient of the unit sphere and uh, it only sees the fundamental group and the homology class. Mm, another fact, which is which still goes in this direction that the spherical plateau problems are a nice generalization of hyperbolic um, metrics, is that um, you have certain kinds of higher dimensional dense fillings. Recall that in dimension three, if you're given any non-compact finite volume hyperbolic manifold, then there exists a sequence of compact hyperbolic three manifolds converging geometrically to M. So this is the so-called hyperbolic dense filling construction of Thurston. You can always approximate a non-compact cusped hyperbolic three manifold by a sequence of closed hyperbolic manifolds. That's um, very interesting. And somehow it's very special to dimension three because there is this uh, theorem of H.C. Vaughan that says that such a phenomenon is impossible for locally symmetric manifolds in other dimensions. So in higher dimensions, it's not possible to have a sequence of closed hyperbolic manifolds converging geometrically to a finite volume, non-compact hyperbolic manifold. However, if you allow yourself to not look at just um, locally symmetric smooth manifold, but general spherical plateau solutions, then suddenly you do have this um, accumulation phenomenon in any, uh, in any dimensions larger than uh, three. So I'm not going to put a precise statement here. I'm just going to give you the rough idea. And so here's a rough idea. You start with a finite volume hyperbolic manifold in dimension n larger than three. And in some other work by Fujiwara and Manning, they could construct topological dense fillings, MI. So those MI now are pseudo manifolds that uh, are not hyperbolic, but they are cat zero. And topologically, they kind of converge to the final volume hyperbolic manifold in um, 
more or less group theoretic sense. But so these MI are pseudo manifolds, you can run the uh, corresponding spherical plateau problem and get spaces, right? So for each MI, you get the CI infinity. And the claim is that those spherical plateau solutions, CI infinity, when I goes to infinity, they converge subsequently to an integral current space that is intrinsically isometric to M. So it's really analogous to what's happening in dimension three, except that now you're looking at spherical plateau solutions instead of smooth uh, symmetric manifold, locally symmetric manifolds. So those are- uh, May I ask you something? But yes. how essential it is that your manifold of constant curvature wouldn't it be true also a variable curvature, say pinched or something? Um, because again, we have a cuspid infinity, you can compactify it the same way. And it seems to me the same is uh, rather stable. That's true. But um, at least in the way I can prove things, I really need somehow um, that the limit is very homogeneous, so hyperbolic, so that I can identify the limit. If the, the finite volume negatively curved manifold is just some random negatively curved manifold and you can maybe fill it in. Um, I don't know how to identify the limit of uh, the- No, but there will be a limit, maybe even non-unique, there may be may many candidates. So the point is uniqueness, of course, with the limit, right? In, in general, yeah, of course, the yeah, answer yeah. will be different, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's in a way, it's because there is uniqueness for this limit object, regardless of how you achieve this limit. But limit always will be there. Yeah, the limit is always there just by- Yeah, you always get this non-compact out of compact. But you don't know what it is, of course, you can't yeah, yeah, yeah. but the that's limit right. always there. That's right. The, that's right. the only point, unicity, which has little to do with this limit. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so, so it's just it's uniqueness just... of this finite volume the realization of yours, yeah. That's true. That's okay. True. And so, okay, so th these, Results somehow for me are, are a good sign that this Ferco Plateau problem is uh, worth studying because you start with this simple minimization problem, but you get interesting spaces in the end, right? Um, um, so, in oh, it's, it's yeah, so um, I'm going to give you some applications of such classification theorems. Um, but first, uh, open question. So, can you prove uniqueness instead of uniqueness up to intrinsic isometry? So here I have some pseudo classification theorems, but they're all up to intrinsic isometries. And it would be more desirable to have just pure uniqueness as integral current spaces, which is the natural setting. Mm, I don't really know how to do that. So it's uh, a question. And of course, there, there's this harder question maybe, which is that everything, even the computation of the circle volume is completely open for general higher rank or locally symmetric manifolds. Um, basically everything that's um, true for say hyperbolic manifolds or rank one locally symmetric manifolds in that kind of story is based on the work of Besson courtois gallo which works very well for rank one, but not so well for higher rank. So those are some of the questions for, for, for uh, symmetric manifolds. And uh, let's see. So let me give you some applications to uh, stability of certain geometric inequalities. Um, let me maybe skip that one, which is a intrinsic flat stability uh, statement. Let me directly move on to the second application where you consider a uh, closed surface, sigma, of genus at least two. And remember the uh, definition of the volume entropy. It measures the exponential growth of geodesic balls in the universal cover. So fix a point in the universal cover tilde of sigma, okay? And let BPR be the geodesic ball of radius R and center P. The volume entropy H is defined as this limit. So the limit of the log of the volume of those balls divided by R. Since the sigma tilde is the cover of this compact surface sigma, this limit always exists. And by the way, it does not depend on the choice of the base point P. 
So that's the first invariant that I'm going to talk about. And the second invariant is the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on the universal cover. So you have this complete non-compact surface and you can look at the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian, which is as usual, defined as this infimum of the radial energy where you take the infimum over all non-zero functions in say W12. These two invariants are very natural and they're related by a simple inequality, which is the following. So the entropy first eigenvalue inequality states that the uh, first eigenvalue is always at most the volume entropy square over four. Later, we will always rescale the metric so that the uh, volume entropy becomes normalized equal to one. And so when that's the case, lambda zero is at most one over four. It is a well-known fact that hyperbolic metrics achieve that equality. So for hyperbolic metrics, um, if you look at the universal cover, the lambda zero of the hyperbolic plane is one over four. And so among normalized metrics on this universal cover, the hyperbolic metric is maximizing the first eigenvalue. And the proof is uh, very easy. I'm going to give it in a few slides. So here are some questions for uh, this setup. First, is it true that if you have equality, then sigma TLG is the hyperbolic plane? In fact, it's non-trivial. It not, does not follow from the proof of the inequality, which is interesting. And second question is, can you get a stability statement, meaning uh, that if lambda zero is close to one over four, is it true that in some sense, at least, this universal cover is close to the hyperbolic plane? Now, of course, question two implies that the answer to question one is yes. Mm, so here's a result. Let sigma g be as before. So sigma g is a genus at least two closed oriented surface and uh, you normalize the metric so that the volume entropy is one. So here's the statement. Uh, first, you have rigidity. So if lambda zero is equal to one over four, then you have the hyperbolic plane. In fact, you are hyperbolic. That's okay. Uh, what about the second question? Well, if lambda zero is close to one over four, then what you can state is that sigma tilde, this universal cover, is close to the hyperbolic plane indeed, but only in an averaged sense. So the Benjamin Schramm topology, I'm going to talk more about that in the next slides. Some remarks. First remark is that I think that the rigidity part should also follow from work of Le Drapier. He uses completely different methods from dynamical systems um, I don't see how this kind of method from dynamical systems can give geometric stability results. So stability is really the main focus on, on, of my discussion now. And in particular, I'm going to explain why you need this Benjamini from topology and uh, why it's more or less sharp. And a fun fact is that I recently learned that there are at least formally comparable results for graphs, because you know, for, for say D regular graphs, you can um, talk about uh, the uh, first eigenvalue of the corresponding Laplacian, and you have some similar stability uh, results, and they also use the Benjamin Schramm topology. Okay, that, that's fun. Mm. Okay, so I need to talk to you about this Benjamin Schramm topology. This apology of Benjamini and Schramm comes from graph theory mainly and uh, probability, but it has been uh, rarely used in differential geometry. Um, so what does it say? Well, more or less, it says that if you have a sequence of metrics on the surface, you look at the universal covers, you say that they converge to the hyperbolic plane H2 in this Benjamin Schramm topology when you have the following. For any 
radius d, if you look at the random geodesic ball of radius d inside this universal cover, this random geodesic ball is going to look like the hyperbolic ball of radius d with probability going to one as n goes to infinity. So that's the definition, informal definition of Benjamini from convergence. Well, this is a finite cover, excuse me, sigma tilde. Oh, sorry. So it's a, the universal cover. So I, this is my- But what do you mean a random? Which, yeah. uh, no, which measure? That's right. Uh, so here, the natural way to pick a random geodesic ball is to, you fix any, um, since you care everything about balls only up to isometry, and since your universal cover is covering a compact surface, you can just define a random geodesic ball as choosing the center in a fundamental domain. So you only care about the uh, ball. Uh, okay, okay, so you have fixed, I thought you have variable, variable thing. You have fixed uh, fundamental domain, okay. Yeah, um, well, you can choose the fundamental domain as you wish. Yeah, right? yeah I understand, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's a measure, it's a measure with respect that downstairs and the random meaning again, the random exactly is still what it means. That's it's right. Probability going to, to one or what? Yeah, yeah, yes. So, okay, it's probability going to one. Okay. It's probability going to one. So, again, you have a way, natural way to pick up random geodesic balls in the universal cover because you only care about things okay. up to us. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I got it. And um, yeah, the, the convergence here is just saying that using those kind of random balls, then the probability that it looks like the hyperbolic ball is converging to one. So that's a little bit uh, vague. It would mean looks like, exactly, looks right. like. Right, so uh, this is my next slide. Yeah. So I need to define what I mean by look like. And one way is to use the um, intrinsic Prokhorov topology. Uh, another way is to use, in fact, the intrinsic flat topology. I, I decided to use the Gromov to Prokhorov topology because, because of some reasons. So S1 looks like another surface S2 if you have the following. So S1, S2 are two Riemannian surfaces and there are epsilon close in the Gromov Prokhorov topology. If then they can be both isometrically embedded in one given Banach space, such that the push forward measures are epsilon closed in the natural weak start uh, topology, the, the Prokhorov topology. There's a Prokhorov distance. Okay, so look like just means that as measures, you can embed them in a common Banach space. And as measures in the weak start topology, they are very close. So let's restate what the Benjamin from convergence is. You have a sequence of uh, universal covers and you say that they converge to the hyperbolic plane in this topology. If for any D and for any epsilon, you take a random ball of radius D inside this universal cover, it's going to be epsilon close to the hyperbolic ball of D in that gromov prokhorov topology with probability going to one as uh, n goes to infinity. So you see that in this definition of the Benjamin Schram topology, you, you first need a first topology, which is here the Gromov Prokhorov topology, to define what look like means. And again, you could have used the intrinsic flat, uh, pointed intrinsic flat topology. You'd have gotten all the same results. And in fact, the proofs are, are, are using the intrinsic flat topology. So. Any questions on the Benjamin Schrand topology? All right. Mm, so why do, do I need gromov prokhorov topology or alternatively the intrinsic flat topology? Well, so both these topologies mean that you're close as measures essentially. And we need such a notion because the first eigenvalue is not good, going to control the geometry very finely uh, and strongly. So in particular, for instance, it is possible to add some very thin spikes to the hyperbolic plane. That's not going to change the volume entropy by much. That's not going to change lambda zero by much. But in say, gromov hausdorff you're going to be very far away. So it's just, gromov hausdorff is definitely not the good topology here. 
So you need some kind of closeness as measures. So that's why intrinsic flat topology or uh, gromov prokhorov topology. That's the first remark. And the second remark is that uh, why do you need Benjamin from? Why can't you just uh, use pointed gromov prokhorov or pointed intrinsic flat? Well, um, Benjamin from topology means that convergence means that a random ball typically will look like a ball in the limit, right? So why do you need that? It's because even if lambda zero is very close to one over four, it can be that on arbitrarily large regions in the universal cover, you are far away from being hyperbolic. Because so you need the boundary, because something happens near the boundary. Not, the big not, not boundary. So here you have a closed surface, but near the thin part. No, no, but you, when you move in this fundamental domain, uh -huh. the two balls overlap of a smaller ball of fixed radius. So the only contribution, the difference comes from the band around the boundary of the ball, right? The balls are essentially the same inside of a smaller ball. Because, right, any two balls coincide on the ball of radius, big radius minus finite error. Right, but essentially I Essentially the diameter of your, of your surface. I don't think I agree with this claim that uh, problems come from the boundary of the fundamental domain. But because... again, if you take any two balls yeah. and the center is coming from the same fundamental domain, because the distance, the domain is head bounded diameter. So the overlap of the ball of a smaller radius. So this is equal to this ball. Right. But the fundamental so the domain... only contribution to measure come if, if it were amenable, it wouldn't happen at all, right? It only happened because there is a definite contribution from the boundary exactly corresponding to this lambda. It's exactly this one quarter enters in the game, right? Because um, volume of this boundary of this band essentially related to this one quarter. I think so. I'm not sure I understood the comment, but um, let me just mention that here, nothing depends on the choice of fundamental domain. And so here, the geometric picture is that maybe you have a surface that's almost hyperbolic, but it has very thin handles. So it's hyperbolic on most of the volume, uh, most of the area of the surface, but they have very thin handles where it's not hyperbolic. So in the closed surface, this has small area, so you don't really see that. But if you look at the universal cover of that, yes. then the thin handles where it's not hyperbolic unfold to a huge region that is not hyperbolic. So this is the geometric picture. No, but I don't see why one ball catches it better than another ball. Because this ball overlap of a concentric ball. So they would feel it, it modular error on the boundary. This is what I what, 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 oh, oh, OK. I see the question. So here, again, in this uh, definition of binary from, you first fix a radius, right? You fix a radius of the ball. But now you have this sequence of universal covers. So in particular, the fundamental domain for this metric might convert to infinity, right? So when wait, you wait, fix- wait, 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 so, so, ah, you have variable surface. That's right, that's right. Ah, so because the diameter of the surface may go to infinity. That's right, the surface- ah, Okay, okay, okay. If the diameter goes to infinity, then it's ideal, okay. Right. So you have, uh, let me just- okay, yeah, I, I, I assume they have bounded diameter, okay. Okay, okay. No, 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 you, you don't put any such condition on the surface. Okay, um, okay, no, no, I understand then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just for, for other people, uh, I, I repeat that I have this sequence of closed Riemannian surfaces. I'm assuming that in the universe cover, lambda zero converges to one over four. And I, I, I'm interested in the geometry of this universal cover. Mm. So let me come back to, to Benjamin Schramm. You can use other, I think, less natural ways to, to take care of this problem, but Benjamin Schramm is here basically because if you look at the universal cover of such a surface, it's not true that you will look like the hyperbolic plane everywhere. It's just not true. Mm. Okay, let... okay, so you have to go away from this narrow handle. You have uh, very, yet bigger and bigger handles, more and more narrow, and somehow you have to avoid it, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. 
So the bad region, the pot potentially bad regions that don't look like the hyperbolic plane in the universal cover come from those thin and long handles with very small area in the quotient surface. Um, let me review this uh, classical inequality because the proof is, is given on one slide. Remember that this inequality tells you that lambda zero is at most H2 over four. So how do we prove such a thing? Well, you want to upper bound the lambda zero. So you just need to find a good test function, right? And the good test function is coming from this assumption on the volume entropy. If you fix a point on the universal cover and you fix any uh, weight, so C should be strictly larger than H, sorry. So you fix a C that is strictly larger than H, the volume entropy, then you can check that the falling function is in fact in L2 and also its derivative is in L2. So you can use that function as a test function uh, in the um, definition of lambda zero and you get that um, there's a little um, easy computation here that shows you that um, this particular uh, quotient, this, the ready energy of this particular test function is equal to C2 over four. But C can be any number that is strictly larger than H. Oops. So you conclude directly that um, lambda zero is at most H2 over four. If you look at this proof and you think about that, you try to say prove the rigidity statement using that proof. It seems really hard. I, I have no idea how to do it. So th this is a funny situation where the proof of the equality is trivial, but the proof of what's happening at equality or near quality does not come from just looking at the equality case in, in this chain of inequalities or something. Um, right, so unfortunately it seems that this simple proof cannot really be used to get rigidity or stability statement. If you see a way, please stay, uh, let me know because I would be interested. But I think it's hard or not really possible. And this is related with the fact that say on the hyperbolic plane, you have that lambda zero is one over four, but this one over four is, never, is not really realized by an actual eigenfunction in L2. Um, so the strategy to prove such a result is to reduce the problem to the problem of classification of certain spherical plateau solutions for the corresponding surfaces. And I'm going to be very vague here, and I apologize, but let me give you an analogy uh, using a very simple toy model to, to, to just illustrate how the classification of spherical plateau problems can be used for stability results. Mm. So let's forget about a uh, spherical plateau problem. Let's just consider the unit circle in R3 bounding a disk D, a flat disk that you imagine as lying the first two coordinate planes. So X1, X2 plane uh, of area pi. So this flat disk, it's well known that it minimizes the area over all surfaces with the same boundary C. So how do you prove that D is a stable minimizer of the area among all surfaces, again, in R3 with boundary the circle C. What you can do is to take an arbitrary sequence of compact surfaces with boundary C, and you suppose that the, the area of S, N, is converging to the minimum, which is pi. And you would like to show that it converges back to D, what you do is you use this federer Fleming's usual compactness theorem, and you get so a subsequence converging in the flat topology to a integral current S infinity, such that the boundary of S infinity is still this unit circle. And moreover, you can show that the area of S infinity is pi. So this is um, the first step. Just use compactness and then the second thing is that even though this generalized surface S infinity is not smooth, probably maybe a priori, 
you can show a posteriori that it is in fact equal to D by a calibration argument. So you have this calibration, D is nicely calibrated. And since S infinity realizes this infimum, it has to be calibrated. So it has to be D essentially. And that is already the, the end of the proof. So you have the desired stability, at least in the topology of uh, the, the flat topology here. So here, here's the very simple principle that if you want to prove stability, you just need to prove uniqueness in some larger class where you have compactness. So that's uh, something well known. Mm. Let me finish. So, uh, Outline of the proof. Well, let, let me give you a very quick, dishonest outline. Um, remember, you have a sequence of normalized metrics, Gn, on the universal cover. They cover a compact surface that is fixed, um, topologically fixed. And uh, suppose that lambda zero converges to one over four. Then the plan is the following. First, you find a special embedding, phi n, of your Riemannian surface inside this spherical quotient. It's chosen in such a way that when lambda zero converges to one over four, uh, then the image of sigma, there shouldn't be no uh, quotient here, the image of sigma by phi n almost minimizes the area among all homotopic, in fact, homologic, homological surfaces in this quotient of the sphere. And moreover, phi n is going to be almost a Riemannian isometry. Now you can use the classification theorem. Remember that the classification theorem tells you what the um, uh, circle plateau solutions are. And if you think about what it means, it just means that for n large, the image of sigma by phi n is very close to a hyperbolic surface in the intrinsic flat topology. This is basically what it means. And so you're done. This is uh, essentially the proof. Mm, so for n large, you have shown that on most of sigma gn, the surface looks like a hyperbolic metric. In, again, in thin handles, you might have very small area, but a very non-hyperbolic metric. So that's why going to the universe cover, which is what I care about, you don't really see the hyperbolic plane everywhere, but on most places, you will see uh, something resembling the hyperbolic plane. And uh, here's a comment. So here in the proof, what we did is we embedded sigma tilde in the Hibbert sphere. And somehow, because lambda zero converges to its maximum, the images converge to a minimal surface in this unit sphere. So there's something to say here, which is um, you have some previous work in the compact situation that resembles a little bit that setup because you, you have a series of, and I'm going to finish, I think, with that. So you have a series of um, results on compact surfaces where you try to look at not the classical inequality I mentioned, but the Hirsch inequality or the yang Yao inequality. And instead of lambda zero of the universe cover, you look at lambda one. Instead of the entropy, you look at the area. And um, when you try to maximize lambda one times the area, you have that you have certain embeddings of the surface inside a Euclidean sphere of a high dimension, such that the images converge to some minimal surface in this Euclidean sphere. So you see that it's very analogous in some sense to um, um, what I described. And uh, using such things, you can also prove stability for the harsh inequality that's due to Karpukin, Nahon, Polterovich, Stern. And you can also look at work on the stack of eigenvalues on compact surfaces. So to summarize, you have all those works plus the one I talked to you about today, where you try to maximize some first uh, non-trivial eigenvalue of some operator related to the area or the length of something. And in both cases, you see minimal surfaces in spheres appearing. Somehow th this is a general phenomenon but I don't really know how to uh, unify everything in a more, in a cleaner way. So I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to end here. Uh, thank you for your attention and let me know if you have questions.